Hi, uh, welcome to Study Sunday. This is Steph York. I'm the P political secretary of Freedom Road Socialist Organization, and I am so glad to be with you today uh, to talk about On Contradiction. Uh, this essay on philosophy was written by Comrade Mao Zedong uh, after his essay on practice and really with the same object of overcoming the serious error of uh, dogmatist thinking that could be found in the party at the time. Uh, on Contradiction is a philosophy essay uh, on the law of the contradiction in things, and that is the law of the unity of opposites, a basic law of dialectics. Lenin said that dialectics in the proper sense is the study of contradiction in the very essence of objects. Uh, and, you know, it's really great that readings like on contradiction are available on the internet. When I pulled it off to up my bookshelf, uh, I uh, like to read on contradiction from my paper book, uh, Mao's Greatest Hits, uh, uh, otherwise known as the officially as the selected readings. Um, this book of selected readings was put together in 1965 for education within China, and then published in a number of languages in 1971. And a significant weight of the book as a whole, like the weight of the political struggle in China prior to the Cultural Revolution was against dogmatism. Uh, on contradiction and paired with on practice, which is also um, part of this book, and on the correct handling of contradictions amongst the people, are for me essential works that are all, and that they're all contained within selected readings. Um, and I think there continues to be a need to combat dogmatism. Uh, Marxism-Leninism is a science uh, that, uh, that we who want to change society use to analyze the world and make plans, carry them out in practice, sum them up and make new plans. There are only a few greater disservices that we can do to Marxism-Leninism than to treat it as, a, as only a doctrine, to quote it chapter and verse. Uh, I strive to be a dialectical materialist in all of my thinking, whether it's political work or cooking. Additionally, I think dialectics can assist us in locating and understanding the nature of our own errors in thinking. And um, when I'm grappling with a particular problem, I find it really helpful to reread on contradiction with that problem in mind and even make sketches of the dialectical method to clarify um, my thinking and pull out the different threads of contradictions that exist uh, in my works that, that, to help me to identify what is um, uh, principle. And so, um, I've been asked to hold my remarks to under 20 minutes, but as you can tell by my enthusiastic introduction, uh, I really, uh, I think that this work is very important and I really appreciate it and perhaps get even a little bit nerdy about it. <laughs> uh, but uh, in order to cover, uh, to keep my remarks somewhat contained, um, I'm gonna cover what I think are some of the most important elements of the reading. I'm gonna focus on three parts. Uh, and I've chosen the three parts that focus what I think Mao intends to highlight uh, in the article. Uh, his principal aim in this piece is is to oppose uh, dogmatism and to specifically attack eclecticism. Uh, eclecticism is the notion that dialectus just means listing out a whole, the sum total of contradictions that exist uh, and not focusing on relationships and principal aspects. And so, and I think that eclecticism is, is Mao's principal aim, uh, principal target, if you will, uh, in this piece. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that's specifically where this piece is different uh, than, say, the writings of Stalin or Cornforth um, that are essentially covering the same topic, dialectical materialism. And you can do many different studies using the uncontradiction reading. Uh, uh, and I, of course, recommend reading the whole piece uh, to get an all-sided understanding of dialectics, especially if um, uh, it's your first introduction to the ideas uh, uh, of, dial of dialectics and dialectical materialism. But to draw out this lesson on eclecticism that I think that Mao is focusing on, I'll be focusing on three parts of the piece. Uh, one, the, two, the question of the two world out outlooks and an introduction 
to dialectics in its basic. Uh, section three, the particularity of the contradiction, uh, that the general is made up of the sum total of particulars. And point four, the principal contradiction and the principal aspect of the contradiction the method by which we determine what the heart of the matter is, and most importantly, develop a way to solve it. Um, so we'll start with the two world outlooks. Throughout the history of human knowledge, oh, I should say, uh, to be uh, absolutely transparent, I am much of what my talk here is, is, is quoting the text. Uh, so many of these words are Mao's and not mine. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to summarize them. Uh, uh, and what will hopefully be a useful way. So um, the two world outlooks. Throughout the history of human knowledge, there have been two conceptions concerning the laws of development of the universe, the metaphysical conception and the dialectical concept, which form two opposing world outlooks. Uh, and Lenin says that, that there are two basic or two possible or two historically observable uh, conceptions of, the, of development. Uh, development as de decrease and increase only and repetition and the development of unity of opposites, the division of a unity into mutually exclusive opposites and their reciprocal relationship to each other. Uh, and when Lenin says this, he's referring to the two different outlooks. Uh, and for a long period in history, whether that was in China or in Europe, this way of thinking, which is part of the idealist world outlook, occupied a dominant position in human thought. Now, we haven't done on practice, and I don't want to assume too much prior knowledge, but I'm, so I'm going to do five seconds on uh, idealism versus materialism. Uh, so a five second review from on practice, uh, also an excellent article that you should read. Idealism fundamentally holds that consciousness is the primary shaper of reality. An example of this would be postmodernism uh, uh, that, for example, uh, posits that uh, shaping language shapes society rather than society shaping language. Uh, materialism is the view that people's knowledge about the world and our society depends on their practical activity, especially in material production, but also in social practice that includes class struggle, political life and cultural and artistic pursuits. So basically materialism is not Madonna and diamonds, uh, uh, though they're part of the material world. Uh, materialism is the idea that our society, our way of thinking about the world is shaped by our actual practice in the world. And idealism is the, is the notion that society and our ideas about it are shaped by our own consciousness or what happens in our heads. So, um, and, uh, uh, and uh, idealism is united with metaphysics in general, and uh, and materialism and dialectics uh, go together. And we sh we strive to be dialectical materialists. Um, and the metaphysical. Uh, uh, outlook sees things as isolated, static, and one-sided. Uh, it regards all things in the universe as eternally isolated from one another and immutable. Change can only be increase or decrease, hotter or colder, uh, 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 and that the and moreover that the cause of such an increase or decrease or change of place is not coming from inside the thing, but outside of them. Uh, that the motive force uh, of change is external. Uh, and uh, whereas materialists hold that uh, that in the development of each, so, uh, sorry, as opposed to the metaphysical outlook, materialist dialectics holds that in order to understand the development of thing, we have to study it internally and in its relations to other things. Uh, in other words, the development of a thing should be seen as their internal and necessary self movement, while each thing uh, basically is internal and necessary. Uh, uh, and um, but but do we exclude or not think about external causes? Of course we do. Uh, external causes are the conditions of change, and internal causes are the basis of change. And this is where we get the famous Mao quote that says, "Can a um, uh, 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 in a suitable temperature, an egg turns into a chicken. Uh, 
but no temperature can change a stone into a chicken because each have a different basis. So the famous Mao quote that a, uh, that a stone uh, cannot turn into a chicken. Uh, so the, the dialectical world outlook teaches us to observe and analyze the movement of opposites in different things and on the basis of that analysis to indicate the methods for resolving contradictions. And, uh, and, and so it's really important for us to understand the law of contradictions in things in a really concrete way. Um, uh, contradiction has several aspects. I can't talk about particularity without talking about universality, but I'm only going to talk about it briefly. Uh, the universality or absolute of contradiction has means two things. One, the contradiction exists in the process of development of all things. Uh, so, uh, uh, so contradiction exists in everything that there is in the world and that the contradiction exists throughout the development of the process. There is not just one contradiction that then resolves and there is no other contradictions. Uh, uh, when a contradiction resolves, a new set of contradictions are uh, come into being that uh, also have to um, be resolved. Um, but in uh, 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 one is because Mao was really focusing here on uh, dogmatism and eclecticism, he puts a lot of emphasis on the particularity of the contradiction and especially pointing out that um, uh, the universality of a contradiction is really made up of the sum total of its particularities that that there is that um, that there is no such thing as a general without a particular. Uh, and so, and so, of course, you know, when we're when we are talking about uh, revolution or the theory and practice of our activism, and we say we want to combine the general and the particular, we're really talking, uh, in many ways, also about um, uh, this thing, Marxist epistemology, our theory of knowledge, and uh, combining the universal and the particular. Uh, um, so, when man. Uh, uh, attains the knowledge of this common uh, essence. He uses it as a guide to study various concrete things that haven't been studied and discover the particular essence of each and uh, enriches his knowledge. We enrich our knowledge and, um, uh, uh, and we keep developing how we know things um, uh, from, uh, from there. Uh, 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 Mao really goes after the dogmatists here, and I do like this paragraph, so I'm just going to read it. Uh, when our dogmatists err in this question is that, on the one hand, they do not understand that we have to study the particularity of contradiction and know the particular essence of individual things before we can know the universal and common essence, and that, on the other hand, they do not understand that after knowing the common essence, we have to go further and study other things that have not yet been thoroughly studied and have, it, and have only just emerged emerged. Our dogmatists are lazy bones, <laughs> which is just funny. <laughs> uh, and so anyway, uh, 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 we have to understand the relationship between the general and the particular in order to understand the um, Marxist theory of knowledge. And qualitatively different contradictions can only be resolved by qualitatively different methods. So, for instance, the contradiction between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie was re is resolved by socialist revolution. Whereas the contradiction between the great masses of people and the feudal system is resolved by methods of democratic revolution. And the contradiction between the colonies and imperialism is resolved by the National Revolutionary War, for example. Uh, processes change, old processes and old contradictions disappear, and new processes and new process and new contradictions emerge. And uh, uh, I mean, basically his point is that we have to be particular. We can't treat things as static and, um, uh, and unchanging. And we have to actually um, put the time and effort in to really look at, um, uh, to, to really look at particular contradictions. And then in so doing, um, we, uh, and it, then in so doing, we re, uh, so once we understand what a particular contradiction is, we can't stop there. We have, there are still two points in the problem. 
uh, that have to be singled out for analysis, namely the principal, the, pri the principal contradiction and the principal aspect of the contradiction. Uh, you know, there can be a million uh, contradictions in the development of something that's really complex, like a society. And uh, one of them is necessarily the principal contradiction whose uh, development and whose existence and development determine or influence the existence and development of all other contradictions. I'm just going to say that again because it's really uh, being able to understand the principal contradiction is very important. Uh, the principal contradiction is the contradiction whose existence and development determines or influences the existence and development of all the other contradictions. Uh, for instance, in capitalist society, the two forces in contradiction, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, also, if you uh, try to name a contradiction and you only name one thing, you're not naming a contradiction. <laughs> uh, so uh, if two forces in the contradiction, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie form the principal contradiction. And the other contradictions, uh, like those between the peasantry, uh, uh, or the petty bourgeoisie and the bourgeoisie um, uh, between non-monopoly capitalists and monopoly capitalists, depending on what country you're in, uh, uh, you know, between uh, bourgeois democracy and bourgeois fascism, uh, uh, those uh, those are actually all those are secondary contradictions uh, and that are determined or influenced by the principal contradiction. Uh, and so whatever happens, there's no doubt at all that at every stage of develop, in development of the process, there's only one principal contradiction that plays the leading role. Uh, so if any process, if in any process there are a number of contradictions, one of them must be principal and play the decisive role while the rest occupy a secondary and subordinate position. Uh, and, you, but, and we can't treat all the contradictions in a process as being equal, but we have to distinguish between principal and secondary contradictions and pay special attention to the principal one. But then those two aspects, are the two aspects even of the principal contradiction are not equal. Uh, uh, there might be sometimes of temporary equilibrium, but in general, one, uh, uh, aspect of the contradiction is principal over another. Uh, at the moment, unfortunately, the bourgeoisie is principal over the proletariat in the contradiction between the uh, uh, bourgeoisie and the proletariat. We want to f flip that. <laughs> um, uh, and, um, but you know, that, so it, uh, one uh, can be principal and one can be principal for a long time, hundreds of years, or it can be something can be or, or if you're looking at something more narrow, it can be principal for a short time. Uh, but it's really important to understand which aspect of the uh, is uh, principal because you can't figure out how to attack it and um, uh, change it if you don't know um, what the balance of forces is. Um, and they, uh, and they um, uh, of course, transform themselves. Let's see. Uh, and uh, let's see. Sorry. Uh, so in studying the particular contradiction, unless we examine the two facets, we can't, um, uh, we can't, uh, we can get bogged down and understand what to do, and we can um, uh, sorry. <laughs> and then you and then when you and then sometimes there's a contradiction between being able to follow the text that you wrote and uh, speak uh, <laughs> on the zoom at the same time. And the principal aspect right now is that I've lost my place. <laughs> in the text, but that's okay, because uh, 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 we can move on. Because uh, 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 what I wanted to do actually, um, uh, and uh, unfortunately we're not really live in the sense that, that uh, it's a, a bit difficult for us to do an exercise, but uh, you know, so I'm just gonna take for a second uh, this, the question of, um, 
uh, contradiction and deciding uh, and uh, using dialectics to examine our practical work in the union movement. Because uh, uh, I'm a trade unionist, I know something about it, um, uh, but there's always more to know. But uh, uh, so when we look at our work in the union movement, of course, the, um, the principal contradiction is between the workers and the boss. Uh, or actually, let's just, roll, let's just roll out some contradictions. Some contradictions are between the workers and the boss. Uh, there's co a contradiction between, um, uh, uh, there's a contradiction between uh, uh, militant workers who want to uh, fight the boss and um, bureaucrats who take a more business union approach. Uh, and uh, and uh, sometimes carry out the interests of the boss. There can be contradictions uh, between um, uh, long, longer term workers and uh, young workers. There can be contradictions between um, oppressed nationality workers and uh, uh, and white workers. And uh, you know, we have to view those sum total of those contradictions and understand which one is primary. Obviously in the trade union movement, the contradiction between the workers and the boss is primary, but sometimes, um, sometimes we have to overcome a secondary contradiction in order to be able to attack the primary contradiction. So if we're gearing up for a fight in our union against, um, uh, against austerity and, and a concessionary contract. And we have a union leadership that doesn't want to fight. Uh, uh, and and uh, they're standing, in, they're, they're, standing in, 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 they're playing a role in between us and the boss uh, to try to stop us from being able to fight the boss. Then we may, it may be necessary for us to resolve the con that contradiction uh, before we're able to successfully carry out uh, 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 carry out a fight. Now, some people make a mistake and say, in my opinion, some people make a mistake and say, oh, the, tra the uh, trade union bureaucrats are always uh, an enemy of the same level. Uh, and they're always, uh, and they always play the same role. And that's just not true. Sometimes you can win them over to fighting the boss and, uh, uh, and they can be on your side and, or sometimes you can take them out in an election and they're no longer a uh, uh, no longer a problem, but the main issue is, uh, or the, ma the main thing to understand is uh, uh, an idea that any contradiction is, if you think that uh, any contradiction, especially secondary contradictions, are always static uh, and never change, then uh, then I think it's important to to really sit down with on contradiction and uh, uh, and re and reassess your analysis of the situation because that's certainly not uh, what Mao tells us about um, about uh, contradiction and the nature of dialectics and um, uh, and you know this is primarily uh, uh, this is primarily to be used. Uh, uh, to make uh, change on the ground and to make uh, and to make revolution, it is a uh, uh, these are you know these are these are these are texts not for um, uh, not for in the books but for applying in the real world. So um, anyway, that is my that's my uh, too long book talk <laughs> on on contradiction. Uh, but now I'll be happy to go with the question with questions. And I have, and there's, and there's quite a few. All right. So why is understanding dialectics important for organizing? I think I mentioned it already, um, but I think, um, you know, uh, I think we can develop strategy. We can using dialectics. We can develop clear strategies uh, to um, apply in our organizing to figure out. Um, uh, where we can make uh, real changes in uh, where you know where we can do make, do, make concrete campaigns, uh, really attack concrete uh, conditions. If we just spend all of our time uh, just looking up here and saying the the principal contradiction is between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, well, yes, and does that 
and what is and, and what do you do today? Uh, 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 I think that we have to have an all-sided uh, and more in-depth analysis of the contradictions and what parts are principle. Uh, advice on finding the general in particular when uh, organizing or finding a campaign. Um, I mean, I think that, uh, uh, I think, uh, I think that there's a lot of guidance out in the world to help you find it. For example, you know, uh, I remember, I remember my first lesson in this, I was, I started out organizing as a student uh, who didn't graduate from college, but I did go. And, um, uh, and the, you know, uh, they were trying to close General College, which was like a, um, uh, a college that allowed uh, poor and oppressed nationality students who were underprepared for the university to get into the university and then uh, uh, go for, uh, further. But there, you know, uh, there was an attack on it by the administration. They were trying to close it, and you know, and uh, uh, and uh, so uh, I, I was like, well, our slogan is is uh, keep General College, and the cameras I was working with was like. Uh, yes, but we need to have that part of a more of a general call. And so we settle on education as a right. Uh, but I think, you know, I think that, so I think that our, uh, our general should be something that the masses can still uh, unite with it with, without having to leap over um, six fences. I don't think that a general of um, uh, down with capitalism, uh, 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 keep open general college is I, I think that's that's too many leaps uh, uh, and we ha have to keep it. Um, let's see. We understand the contradictions of living in an imperialist country, but what contradictions do the socialist countries face? Uh, I mean, the socialist. Uh, so I'm going to actually I'm going to leave that question for a little bit later. Um, I am going to actually go down. Uh, to uh, is there a difference between Maoist dialectics and Stalinist dialectics, <laughs> uh, and which one does uh, FRSO follow? So um, this is my opinion, and people can disagree with me. Uh, 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 Mao and Stalin were both Marxist-Leninists. Uh, 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 that is that is uh, how they. Uh, identified themselves and who they are and how I am. Uh, that is how also how I identify as a Marxist-Leninist as well. Uh, I think that uh, uh, so 20 years ago, I would have said that there's no such thing as Maoism or Stalinism, but that's but that has changed. Uh, in fact, political trends uh, develop and come into being. And uh, whereas Stalinist used to be um, a pejorative that was um, that was uh, placed upon Marxist-Leninists by Trotskyists, uh, I think that around 1999, there sort of came together a political trend of thought that can be um, roughly viewed as Stalinist. Uh, but that didn't exist before 1999. Uh, 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 likewise, um, uh, uh, well, likewise, I think that there is a political trend of thought that exists uh, uh, today as Maoism that didn't exist when Mao uh, was alive. And I don't think that um, he that uh, so their their dialectics are not different. I think that they uh, discuss them in a different way and um, emphasize different aspects, but I don't see them as different at all. Um, okay, let's see. What are some of the contradictions we're facing during um, COVID? Uh, uh, I mean, you know, there's a ton of contradictions. Um, on the one hand, I think that uh, on the one hand, we have a contradiction that um, we want to promote uh, the safety and uh, the health and safety of workers, uh, and to place and to place demands that we that place the working class first, and uh, in terms of safety uh, versus a um, uh, versus the capitalist class that is eager to get workers uh, back to work uh, that don't really care about 
um, worker safety and health, that it's primarily about uh, the economy for them. You know, uh, 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 the like I, I live in Minnesota, and there's a uh, turkey processing plant here that now has 600 um, uh, uh, workers, mostly immigrant workers. Uh, 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 yeah, mostly immigrant workers from. Um, uh, Somalia, anyway, most immigrant workers who are infected with COVID-19 uh, and, you know, and so, a percentage of those workers are at risk of uh, death. That that plant knew that that was a risk. They did nothing to, to slow down the line so that they could space workers further apart, uh, to uh, reduce production, to give workers PPE. So I think that that, I think that an enormous contradiction right now with, uh, in terms of COVID is that. And we can see the uh, and we can see the political um, uh, we can see the political debate uh, uh, that's happening with the reopen protests uh, uh, and you know uh, and representatives of the capitalist class who are supporting the herd immunity line that says um, uh, X percentage of people just have to die for the economy for the for, for the sake of cap in order to save capitalism. Um, but there are, you know, but there, are, uh, yeah, and there are many other contradictions, but uh, uh, I won't go into them. Let's see, we understand the contradictions of living in an imperialist country, but what contradictions do the socialist countries face? I mean, I think, um, uh, uh, it's a little soon for an all, I, like, I'm, I don't, uh, I don't feel prepared to do an all-sided analysis of all the contradictions that the socialist countries face uh, right now. But obviously, the socialist countries uh, face, uh, uh, every day face a contradiction with, uh, uh, with imperialism. Uh, let's look, you know, let's look at Cuba, uh, which I had an opportunity to visit uh, uh, last summer. Uh, you know, the, the, the embargo and the attacks by imperialism on Cuba uh, have created real contradictions there, uh, even within socialism. Uh, even even within uh, even within socialism, like uh, I, I saw I saw a country that um, that is on the one hand uh, vibrant and thriving and has a great biotechnology sector and is also really in need of some basic raw materials for uh, like physical repairs uh, uh, of buildings and streets and you know and, and those things are very impacted by the embargo uh, I mean there's many there are many uh, there are many contradictions within uh, uh, there are many contradictions between imperialism and um, uh, within imperialist countries and all and uh, within socialist countries and between socialist countries and imperialism, uh, you really have to actually look at a particular country, uh, study it rather than talking uh, about it off the top of your head and uh, decide what those um, uh, contradictions are. Uh, so what other works, uh, what other Mao works should I read during this time? Um, again, I think that um, uh, I think that on practice, uh, on practice and on contradiction really go together. And, I, and if you want to uh, have a fundamental understanding of the um, uh, of the Marxist epistemology, that is the uh, the, mar the way the way of knowing how the world works that uh, is inherent to Marxism Leninism and is really part part and parcel of historical materialism as well. Uh, uh, then I think you need to read on practice and on contradiction. And then I also recommend, uh, as I said, uh, on connect uh, on correct methods of leadership and uh, on the correct handlings of contradictions amongst the people. Uh, uh, which really, you know, uh, the uh, on on the uh, correct handling of contradictions amongst the people is really, uh, in many ways, on contradiction uh, applied uh, to the social forces of a society. So, um, if yeah, if there aren't any other questions, I um, uh, 
Oh, we have one more question. All right. Uh, uh, while I'm waiting for that to come, I just want to um, uh, I just want to say that I really uh, hope that you are interested in joining FRSO. Uh, check us out for more information at www.frso.org uh, and all of our uh, social media accounts. And then in terms of do it, do I recommend reading on practice or on contradiction for first? I think it's actually simpler uh, and more understandable to read on practice first. Um, but I got to choose which my what my favorite reading was uh, for this uh, uh, for this talk, and so I chose um, uh, I chose on contradiction. <laughs> How do you know you have a bad slogan? Uh, <laughs> oh, people will well people will tell you. <laughs> they will not come to your actions. <laughs> they will uh, uh, look at you funny when you hand them the flyer. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, uh, I like to sort of, I, I like when I, when I have, when I have a slogan, I like to take, um, I sort of, I sort of like to think, put myself in the position of, um, an, you know, an advanced mass that I know, like a real person that I actually know who is not, who doesn't have the same politics as me, but might come to the demo and, uh, think, what would they think of this slogan? Uh, I think it helps, I think. Uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, I want to thank all of you for coming uh, and uh, uh, participating in uh, in today's study Sunday. Uh, yeah, I, uh, long ago, I was a member of the Progressive Student Network, and our slogan was study and struggle. Uh, so uh, study on Sunday, struggle on Monday. Uh, uh, thanks. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>